All right. Well, good morning, church. How is everybody doing? Uh, it is good to see you guys here today. Uh, good to see, you know, we're wrapping out the first week of spring and oh, everything is starting to, you know, melt and thaw out. I can finally see out of my driveway and not have to worry about hitting a car because the snow banks aren't, you know, 12 feet tall anymore. Um, so welcome to everybody who's here in church and, every, and all those who are watching online. Uh, it's an exciting time of year in Cross Lake. Everything is, you know, starting to come back alive. Snow is beginning to melt, and we're only two weeks away from uh, two weeks away from Easter. So, it's the time of year where we gather together with friends and family to celebrate and remember the sacrifice that Jesus made uh, for our sins. So, if you haven't made plans yet, or if you have neighbors, family, friends who are looking for a place to worship on Easter, uh, it would be. I would love it if your family would join us uh, for Easter on April 9th. So um, now if you're able, uh, go ahead and stand for a moment as we honor our God and Savior with a reading of God's word. Uh, we'll be starting in Matthew's Gospel, chapter 1, verses 20 through 23. In it, uh, the scripture says this, But when he had considered this, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream saying, Joseph, son of David, do not be afraid to take Mary as your wife. For the, ch for the child you have been, or who has been conceived in her is of the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. Now all this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the Lord through the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall be with child and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. Father, we ask today that uh, as we listen to your word, that uh, you would work in our uh, hearts a new work. Uh, so many are burdened are, and are waiting and wondering, where are you today, God? When will you hear the cries of our hearts? May you speak faith to us today in a way that will transform our hearts and draw people to your son, Jesus. It's in his name we pray. Amen. Take a look at the person next to you. Say, God is with you. God is with you. Go ahead and grab a seat. All right. So one of the worst feelings in life is to wait. Right? Does anybody say something like, I love to wait? Like, thank you, Lord, for giving me this opportunity to wait in this long line at the bank. Or, you know, think back to when you were a kid. Uh, did you ever say, thank you, Mom and Dad, or Mom or Dad, for giving me this opportunity to wait while you cook dinner? I know my stomach is, you know, shriveled up and twisted in knots, and I very well may perish in this next five minutes while I wait for you to finish, but this chance to wait makes it all worth it. No, nobody talks like that. One of the worst feelings in life is to wait, especially when it comes to waiting on God, right? Some of you feel right now that you might be waiting on God. You prayed for something and you're wondering, God, what's taking so long? God, are you even listening? Have you forgotten me? Do you not even care? You might be praying for who knows what. You might be praying that God would heal you from migraines or restore your knee. Praying you're asking God to bring a loved one to Christ. You might be praying that God would give you a job with real benefits so that you can prepare for or begin to provide for your family. You might ask God to heal you from depression or to save your hurting marriage or for God to bring you a spouse. And yet, the more you pray, the less you see. And you wonder, where are you, God? Some of you may feel like this. You've been praying, and you've been begging, and you've been waiting, and you've been wondering. You believe that God can, but he hasn't, and you've waited so long that no longer you no longer have the peace of knowing that God cares and that he's in control. And you begin to wonder if God even hears your prayers, if he cares, or if he's even there at all. What do you do when you've been waiting? There's a question that I want you to be thinking about as we go through scripture today. Why is God making me wait? 
And I want to show you from Scripture what God is actually doing while we are waiting. If you've ever felt like God is taking a long time, God, I don't know where you are. I don't know why you don't do this. This is exactly the way that people felt in the Bible while they were waiting on God to send a Savior. If you don't know the story, I want to walk, it through, or walk you through uh, today. God promised to send a Messiah. God would send the Savior of the world. God promised that it would happen, and then nothing. For decades after decades, centuries after centuries, in fact, the Bible shows us just how long God's people waited on his promise. We have to go all the way back to the beginning in the book of Genesis in the Garden of Eden. We have to go all the way back to the beginning where you may know the story. God created man. He said, it is good, but it's not good that you're alone. You, gotta, you keep getting in trouble. You need help. So God created Eve. Adam saw Eve. He said, whoa, man. And God said, now you are good together. Be fruitful and multiply. Be blessed. Enjoy the garden. Just don't eat the fruit from that one particular tree. I'm not trying to forbid you from having fun. I'm just trying to free you for a life and a blessing. And Eve gave in, and Adam gave in, and they sinned, and they were ashamed. God brought a covering for them. And then there's this one weird little verse that you may not have noticed before in the book of Genesis, chapter 3. An odd, quirky little verse that many theologians say is the first prophecy that God would send a Savior, that a Messiah would come. Verse 15 says that the seed of a woman would crush the serpent's head. The seed one day through the lineage of Eve would be born and one would come who would crush the serpent, the head of our spiritual enemy, and there would be victory. Death would be conquered, and hell would be conquered, and sin would be conquered, and we would have freedom. One day, it prophesied that God would send a savior through the seed of a woman who would crush the serpent's head. Go all the way back to the third chapter of the Bible, and God promises to send a savior. And then, centuries passed. We could pick it up anywhere in the Old Testament, but we're going back to the book of Isaiah, 700 years before the birth of Christ. In chapter 7, verse 14, the very first that we read earlier in the book of Matthew and was fulfilled in the book of Matthew, we read Isaiah's prophecy, and it says this, Therefore, the Lord himself will give you a sign. Behold, a virgin will be with child and bear a son, and she will call his name Emmanuel. 700 years before this event, Isaiah miraculously prophesies, and yet we had to wait, wait, wait. What is God doing while you're waiting? What's God doing when you're praying for healing or for a blessing or for reconciliation or for provision? Is God messing around with you because he can? He could do it, but he doesn't. Is he cruel? Is he playing with you? Is he teething you? Is he just waiting to show off? What in the world is God doing when you are waiting? Do you ever ask him that question? It's okay to ask these real questions and bring them before a real God who has real answers. What is God doing while you're waiting? To try to answer that question, I want to show you a period of history that's not actually recorded in the Bible. There's a period of history uh, between the end of the Old Testament in the book of Malachi and the beginning of the New Testament that starts in the book of Matthew. It's called the intertestamental period, the 400 years or so between the Old Testament and the New Testament. During this time, during those 400 years, there was no word from God. God didn't speak at all which made things way more difficult because before, while they were waiting on a savior, at the very least, they heard God speaking. But now they continued to wait and they heard nothing. See, I'm guessing that some of you probably feel like that. You're praying on something, having faith, believing for something, and you've got not, no word from God. And you've had a sign that he heard you, and excuse me, you've had no sign that he heard you, no sign that he's active, no sign that he cares. All you want is some answer, any answer. 
God, give me a sign. Give me a feeling. Give me anything. And yet, for some of you, there's nothing at all. What is God doing while we're waiting? Why does God feel so silent? I want to remind you that just because God feels silent doesn't mean he's absent. What God is doing, or what is God doing while we're waiting? What we'll see as we dive further into God's word is that while we're waiting, God is working. While you're waiting, while you're wondering what's going on behind the scenes, God is working. Uh, God is working while you're waiting, while you're wondering what's going on behind the scenes. The goodness of God, the power of God, the provision of God, the grace of God, he's always working. He is always working. He's working in things to bring about good because he loves you. He's a good father, and he cares about you. Uh, Just because you don't see it happening doesn't mean he's not doing anything. What is God doing while you're waiting? God is always working. Let's take a look at a verse in the New Testament that gives us a little bit more context about this, both towards God's timing uh, and towards the season that we're in, both looking back at Christmas and the birth of Christ and looking forward and to the upcoming celebration of Jesus' resurrection. It's found in Galatians chapter 4, verses 4 and 5. Here the Apostle Paul says this, But when the set time, say with me, set time, set time, but when the set time had fully come, what did God do? In that set time, God sent his son, born of a woman, remember Genesis chapter 3, the seed of a woman, born of a woman, born under the law to redeem those under the law that we might receive adoption to sonship. At the perfect time, in the perfect time, moment. When the time had fully come, God sent his son Jesus to purchase us out of our sinful lifestyle, to redeem us with forgiveness of grace. He did that so we no longer were children of sin, but instead we are children of the Most High God. Our God did that in the perfect time. The original uh, language in Greek says, pleroma chronu. The two words translated Uh, that the time had fully come are the words pleroma chronu. Chronu, like chronology, uh, it's like a clock. It means time. Pleroma means complete or full measure. Together, it means the perfect time. Some translators in different Bible translations say, uh, but when the time was right, God sent his son. Uh, Another translation says, but when the fullness of time had come, God sent his son. Literally, pleroma chronu means, but when the time was fully pregnant. And as the mothers in here can attest, you know what that means. In other words, when it's not time, you can't force it. And when it is time, there is nothing on earth that can stop it, right? It's not about, or if it's not God's time, you can't make it happen. And, uh, but if the time, or but when the time is fully right, there is no power on earth that can stop the will of God from coming forth. But when the time was right, God sent his son, born of a woman. Remember Genesis, we talked about the seed of a woman. From the seed of a woman would come the Savior who would crush the serpent. Why does it say that? See, this is a little bizarre. If you look everywhere else in Scripture, when you look at a genealogy of a seed of a people, it always talks about the seed of a man. This is the only time you're going to see uh, the seed of a woman. Why? Because Jesus was born of a virgin. He wasn't born of, from the seed of a sinful earthly man. Instead, how was he conceived? By the Holy Spirit. So his father was of a divine nature, born of a virgin, therefore he didn't inherit the sin nature that we inherited. Born of the seed of a woman, conceived by the Holy Spirit, He was perfect in every way. That's why he could be the perfect sacrifice, the innocent one, the Lamb of God, slain for the sins of our world, forgiving us. That's how good our God is. You see how scripture ties us all together. Adam and Eve sinned, centuries passed. Um, People were waiting on the Savior, and when did God fulfill his promise and send the Messiah? Messiah. 
The answer is when the time was just right. At the perfect moment, God sent his son. Looking back, we can see why God waited. Sometimes in hindsight, you see more of the why behind the wait. Somebody probably needs to hear that today because right now you don't see why you're waiting. But years from now, you may look back and you may say, oh, wow, I'm so glad he didn't do that. Or, you know, maybe I'm glad he did. Uh, sometimes in hindsight, you can see the why behind the wait. When we look back, we can see exactly why God waited for the perfect time. His ways are always good. Just because God feels silent doesn't mean he's absent. Whenever you're waiting, remember that God is working. Back to, back to that intertestamental period, those 400 years between the Old Testament and the New Testament. How many of you guys enjoy history? You know, raise your hand. Yeah, it's, you know, I've always had a tough time in school remembering the names and the dates, uh, but it's always fascinating to see th how certain events line up in history through the, er, through the past to lead up to something that nobody could have expected. So today we're going to have a little history and see five of the most important things that God was doing in those 400 years while everybody else was waiting. See, the first thing, have any of you guys ever heard of Alexander the Great? Yeah, Alexander the Great. In 12 years, Alexander conquered the entire world. If you've ever wondered when you conquer the entire world, they put the, name, the word great next to your name. They call a lot of people the goat nowadays, but all that they've done is dunk the basketball. Alexander conquered the entire world, and that's why they call him great. Why is this significant? Because this was the first time in history there was a common language. In those days, almost everyone spoke at least a little bit of Greek because Alexander the Great conquered the world. The second thing that happened during this time, the Old Testament was translated into, guess what? Into Greek, the language that everyone spoke. Instead of teaching with one-way, or excuse me, uh, previously it, the Old Testament was in Hebrew until about the year 280 or so BC. The Old Testament and all of its prophecies about the Messiah were translated into Greek. Uh, the third thing, you may have heard of the Socratic method. This was a brand new uh, way of learning that emerged, and for the first time, instead of teaching with one-way communication, people were encouraged to ask questions. They learned by uh, asking instead of just by hearing. And number four, in 63 BC, the Romans conquered the Greeks. This was a very unusual and unprecedented time of peace. And so while the Romans weren't having to build roads, uh, they weren't having to fight wars, instead they were developing roads and highways and a transportation system, making travel possible as it was like never before. And number five, there was this thing known as the diaspora. The diaspora was a really weird season where the Jews who you know, didn't necessarily want this were forbidden from living in Jerusalem. And suddenly, there were, they were dispersed throughout the entire Roman world. When you add all of these things together, you start to see the why behind the wait. Where are you, God? What are you doing? What were you doing in that season of silence? Well, suddenly, in those 400 years, when people wondered where God was and what he was doing, suddenly, for the first time ever, people could read a Bible in the language that they understood. And for the first time ever, they were not only encouraged to ask questions to God uh, uh, who, would, who was about to send an answer whose name is Jesus. Out of nowhere, for the first time in the history of the world, the good news of a savior could travel through a common language across roads and across highways through a Jewish people who were spread throughout the, throughout the entire Roman world, then to the Gentiles and beyond. In other words, God's people were waiting. But while God's people were waiting, God was still working. In the same way, while you're praying and you're wondering and you're hoping and you're asking and you're waiting, God is still working. He's always working behind the scenes. Some of you right now may feel like you're in a holding pattern. You're waiting, believing doing everything that you know to do, trusting in a God who says he can, and yet he hasn't. You might be wondering, what did I do wrong? Have I failed? Is there a lack of faith in my life? Is there sin in my life? 
Have I let God down? Does he not care about me? If you're waiting, you're not alone. When we look to the Bible, Abraham and Sarah waited 25 years to hold their son Isaac. 25 years. Joseph had a vision to rule, to lead, to influence, to save. He waited 13 years. Much of that in a prison for a crime he did not commit. The woman um, with the issue of blood, 12 years. 12 years in private agony, unable to function like a normal woman, held up relationally, interpersonally, spiritually, unclean. 12 years to touch the hem of the garment of the one who said, your faith has healed you. A man who couldn't walk for 38 years, 38 years, unable to walk before Jesus looked at him and said, pick up your mat, take it home on your own two feet, and you are healed. While you're waiting, while you're waiting right now and you don't see anything, God is working. While you're hoping, while you're wondering, God is waiting. God's delays are not necessarily God's denials. Just because he hasn't doesn't mean that he's not going to. Maybe it's just not the time yet. Uh, in other words, while you're waiting on it, if you don't know what it would be for or I don't know what it would be for you, but for some of you, you're waiting on the answer. You're waiting on the miracle. You're waiting on the provision. You're waiting on the relationship. Whatever it is, maybe the reason you're waiting on it is because it's not ready yet. God is still working on it. God is still working. See, back when I was at Heartland Master's Commission, this was a year after I graduated from high school and about uh, a year after, I was, uh, after God placed a call on my min or, uh, ministry on my life. And during that time at Heartland, we were preparing to go on a mission trip to a country known, called Moldova. Now, Mo much of Moldova is still a rather undeveloped country. It sits right on the border of Ukraine, and much of the country is divided into small villages. And many of these villages relied on spiritual leaders and superstitions to guide them because they had not yet heard the name Jesus. And during that time of preparation and prayer, God gave me a vision of a man who was born with no legs. And so I begin to pray for this man, uh, stepping out in faith. I pray for spiritual healing and restoration for this man and that he would come to have a personal relationship with his Redeemer. Fast forward to about a month to when we're in country, and for about a week, we're in this little village helping the missionaries to build a footprint um, in the community and found a new church. And while we're there, time moves on. I begin to wonder, did God really promise me that this would happen? Did I make it all up? Did I not pray hard enough? But while I was waiting, what I didn't see was that God was working. Because, he was, because this man was a deformed, uh, this man was considered curse. He was touched by the devil, an outcast. And behind the scenes, God was working on him. God was sending translators and volunteers to his house using uh, packages of food and water to introduce him to the love of the Savior. And while God was overcoming the doubts and the lies in his mind that had been built up over a lifetime, and it wasn't until our last day in the village when God fulfilled his promise, and I saw this man crawling down the dirt road to the church, and we were able to lead him in a prayer of salvation. See, so you might be waiting on it, and God may be working on it. Or God may not be working on it because it may be ready, but you may not be ready. Maybe God's working or waiting on you to get ready. He's doing something in you. He's doing something in you. Maybe you prayed and believed, I'd be married one day and you're single. God's doing something in you. Maybe, uh, maybe you're married and wondering, God, why don't you hear my prayer? Why don't you bring healing into my marriage? Maybe you're believing for the job that's going to meet uh, the needs of, that you have in a way that your education and your preparation is worthy of. Or you're in a holding zone and you're waiting and praying and begging and believing that God is going to bring healing and restoration to your sons or daughters that you love so much. While you're waiting, God's working. He may be working on it. He may be working on you. You may not be ready yet. What I found is that God will often do something in you 
before he does something for you. He does something in you before he does something for you. You're waiting, you're waiting, and you're waiting. Don't waste that waiting. Don't waste the waiting. Maybe what God is doing is he's teaching you to depend on him in a way you never have before. Maybe he's revealing his faithfulness to you in a way that you couldn't have experienced otherwise. Maybe you made a mistake a long time ago of praying for patience, and he's teaching you patience. Maybe he's knocking something off of you. Maybe he's chipping away at some sin in your life. Maybe he's conforming you to the image of Christ. Maybe it's not ready. Maybe you're not ready. But whatever's going on, don't waste the waiting. Don't waste the waiting. Learn to depend on him like never before. In Isaiah chapter 64, verse 4, uh, the prophet writes, Since ancient times, no one has heard, no ear has perceived, no eye has seen any God besides you who acts on behalf of those who wait for him. When you wait on God, he acts on your behalf. When you wait on God, he moves on behalf of you. He responds. He initiates. He interrupts. No eye has seen, no ear has heard, and no one has conceived the goodness, the power, the grace, the glory of God who acts on behalf of those who wait on God. God's ways are always good. His timing is always perfect. You can trust him. He's not ignoring you. He hasn't forgotten about you. He loves you. He cares about you. He is always good. Our God knows the cries of your heart. And just because he feels silent doesn't mean that God is absent. What's he doing? What is God doing while you're asking, hoping, believing, begging, and praying. While you're waiting, our good, our powerful, our all-loving, our all-knowing God, he is working. He's working. And years from now, when you look back, you may see why the wait was worth it. It's incredibly interesting that Christianity is unique among all world religions. When you think about it, every other religious system in the world people pursue their version of God. Think about it. Any other religious system, when you try to win the favor of God with good works, you try to win the love of God with religious rituals, you try to perform your way to his pleasure. If you're good, you gain favor. If you're bad, you lose favor. You look at every other system of religion in the world, and people try to work their way to God. They pursue God. But Christianity is different. When we serve, we serve a God who pursues us. We serve a God who pursues us. When the time was just right, when the time had fully come, when the moment was perfect, God sent his son, his one and only son. God pursued you. He sent Jesus not for the righteous, but for the sinners and for the broken. He sent Jesus not for those who are already healthy, but for those of us who are sick. He sent Jesus full of grace and full of truth. He sent Jesus the Son who sets people free. We serve a God who pursues us. And maybe the God you're waiting for, what if he's actually pursuing you? 2 Peter 3.9 says this, The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness, Instead, he is patient with you, not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. Our God is patient. In the same way he was patient with me, in the same way he was patient with that man in Moldova, maybe he's being patient with you because he wants everything to come into the knowledge of his goodness, his love, his mercy, and his grace. He is patient. What if the God you're waiting for is waiting for you? What if at the moment, if at this moment, he's waiting for you to say yes to him? If you're hurting, if you're waiting, if you've been praying for a long time and continue to believe and still haven't seen the answer, the provision, the miracle, the healing from God that we'll see, but in everything, God's timing is perfect and that he's always good. And I believe that while I'm waiting, while you're waiting, our God is still working.
So, Father, today, do a work in us that only you can do. We ask for you to work uh, even as we're waiting. And God, help us not to waste that waiting. Chip away at us imperfections, our sins, and mold us in a way uh, so that we become more like you. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen.